Uh, let me take a moment to elaborate on the specific arm of publishing that I work in because it's the impact of digitisation and the digital revolution as a whole on that particular arm of publishing and the ripples that flow from that that's the focus of the talk today. Okay, publishing is a very broad industry which at the moment is dominated entirely globally by five huge, massive global corporations. Um, you may have heard a lot of different names of publishers, but almost all of them belong under one of those five hats, if you like. Uh, now, those publi uh, publishers as a whole uh, publish, they have imprints, they have divisions that publish textbooks, they publish children's books, they publish every type of nonfiction ever known to man. Uh, they also publish um, lots of coffee table books, photo photography books, that sort of thing, as well as a massive slew of fiction. Now, a rough rule of thumb is that uh, fiction accounts for about 60% of all adult book purchases. Um, and that's, that's US figures, but it's also the, pretty much the same anywhere else in the English-speaking world. But with fiction publishing, you've actually got three separate businesses and they're quite separate. You have literary fiction, you have general fiction and you have commercial slash genre fiction slash entertainment fiction, whatever you want to call it, but it's a separate business. Now these three differ in product, in how the works actually reach the audience and in the audience itself, but most importantly of all in how the audience interacts and experiences uh, the product and their expectations of it. For literary, think Peter Carey. For general fiction, think Tim Winton. And for commercial or genre fiction or entertainment fiction, think me or Matthew Riley or uh, Bryce Courtney or Colleen McCulloch. Okay, in general terms, the literary fiction or general fiction author will produce maybe one book in two or more years. For entertainment fiction, we absolutely must produce one book a year and for many of us, we produce two, three and even four books a year. Now, why is that? Well, just think about it. How popular would The Simpsons have been if they had one episode a year? All right? Yes, you know, TV series and books are quite different products, but the concept of audience gaining or attraction and then retention is the same, right? In anything to do with entertainment, once you've reached an audience, you have to hold it. And you cannot do that without getting content out there, right? So that's why entertainment fiction authors are hacks, because we write a lot, <laughs> because we have people who want to read what we write. And that's why uh, that's a major difference between a literary and a general fiction author, and an entertainment fiction author. So unsurprisingly, entertainment fiction is the most lucrative segment of a publisher's business because A, we write a lot and we get out a lot and those books are always the big bestsellers, but also because it's entertainment, right? Anything that's an entertainment product versus a cultural product, the entertainment product is always going to outsell it. Right, so again, that's a basic difference in the business. My talk today explores how the advent of all things digital, and this is not just ebooks, this is the internet as a whole, has fundamentally altered and is still reshaping the global publishing landscape, and in particular, authors' lives. And nowhere is this more apparent than with the commercial entertainment fiction authors. I say global because that's how we now operate, and particularly for entertainment fiction. Storytelling is global. It always has been. Um, and so, you know, now the internet gives us a global reach, we have no longer any sort of constriction on that. All entertainment fiction authors think globally. However, also, almost all of us think US first. And the reason for that is that that is still the biggest English language market for anything in entertainment. So that's our major footprint. We always look for that first. And a lot of the 
figures that I'm going to talk about come from the US market, but also because the US market is the furthest forward in marching down the digitisation uh, or the digital revolution pathway. And it's also a home base for the five major global corporations. If they stumble in the US, then the ripples are going to be felt all around the world. To appreciate the changing landscape of publishing, let's take a look back to where things really sort of took off in the 1950s. The paperback debuted in the US in 1939. It was actually a German innovation. But when they got it into the US, it revolutionised US reading habits because it made the book so much cheaper, like literally penny, penny for a book. Readership expanded astronomically, not just exponentially, astronomically. It was a massive change. And it was initially, these books were initially just um, published by very small, little, new, innovative publishers. But the, with the readership going so literally over the roof, out of the roof, um, the success was seen by the major publishers, the, the sort of venerated publishers, and they jumped on it. And through the 1950s, they either established or bought in uh, mass market paperback publishing presses. And through the 60s, 70s and 80s, the publishing industry just boomed enormously. And it's primarily on the back of the paperback. This was the golden age for publishers. As they were the only viable way to reach an audience, publishers could pay entertainment fiction authors in particular very, very little. But they could sell those books really cheaply, but in massive quantities. It was always a margin play, and they could rake in the profit. While this was a golden age for the publishers, it was not a good time for authors, especially entertainment fiction authors. However, the late 80s and early 90s saw a change in the marketplace because we saw increasing aggregation of the publishers. This is where the global um, corporates that now exist came from. They started in the late 80s and through the 90s they literally started aggregating and merging. And the major reason for that was to bolster their cash flow, which came from primarily entertainment fiction, and to protect their bottom lines. That merging still continues to this day. Literally the last major thing was um, last year, end of last year. The golden age of corporate publishing as such really runs from about 1990 to 2010. It is already reaching its use by date, very definitely, and that's been brought on by the digital revolution. But the first sh shift in the landscape actually occurred from something quite different. It was the mid to late 90s. We saw the rise of the big books, book chains like Barnes & Noble and Borders, and they started to control the access to readers. So publishers had to go through these um, big book chains to reach the readers. And they, were, they really did dominate the American market for a long time there, uh, for many, many years. And that really sort of started to sort of change things because we suddenly had this great new change into hardcover. Right. A lot of entertainment fiction authors like King and so on were originally always published in paperback, not in hardcover. Um, through uh, this time, the 90s, every, every major entertainment fiction author got moved into hardcover. I did as well, but I came back out because I don't agree with hardcover prices. But that was me. Most of them stayed in hardcover, but this was where the hardcover uh, concept of hardcover and then mass market a year later, or e-books, with very high prices came from. Um, it was really the booksellers because they preferred the high margin of hardcover. And so did the publishers because they got more money. So they moved a lot of the authors into like the Kings, the Pattersons, the Grishams and so on, all went into hardcover. So the Nora Roberts, who was originally always mass market. Um, so that was a move that really changed things up, but the publishers kept the major part of the profits, the authors still got very, very little, relatively speaking. Uh, publishers could get such, uh, well, actually, I should go back a bit. The major bestsellers got really, really, really big advances. The Kings, the Pattersons, the Ivanoviches, the Roberts, right? But 
in order to pay those really, really high advances, and we're talking about millions and millions, the publishers needed to take money from the lower ranks of authors, so what they call the mid-list in particular. Um, they have very onerous contracts. Right. The authors get very little, the publishers keep the major profits, the publishers manage to pay a lot of those profits to those major, major authors, but they also keep the bulk of it for themselves. Uh, publishers could get such agreements signed for authors because for authors there was no other way. No other way to get your book out. You had to go through a publisher, so you had to put up with the contracts. However, in the late 90s, something else happened, and it wasn't Amazon. We always hear about Amazon, but it's not that. It's the internet as a whole. Meaning, in the late 90s, uh, the internet actually got to the point where it was readily accessible to the bulk of American households. Right? That was the tipping point. And that meant that, you know, well, Amazon was the best player out there, but there were a lot of other bookstores out there initially. Uh, not so many still standing, but there were a huge you know, number who went on the internet and started selling books. Online bookstores made books available to anyone, anywhere, and relatively cheaply as well. All books, this is an important point, not just the bestsellers, that started the sea change. Suddenly, virtually all books ever published could, were available to anyone, anywhere, and at a decent price. That is, I mean, how cool is that? You know, you can get anything now. If you want, you can go out and get it. Um, that was the golden age for the readers, right? Suddenly, readers could get whatever they wanted anywhere in the world. People often talk about the changes in publishing as being due to the e to e-books, but that's a fallacy. The change causing the massive upheaval that we're still seeing uh, in publishing is the reader switching from purchasing a physical product in a bricks and mortar store to purchasing online, whether it be a print book, an e-book, an audio book, whatever. The switch to e-books and, or the advent of e-books and also downloadable audio is just pushing forward and adding impetus to a change that's already underway. Publishers have actively resisted this change because, surprise, it means they lose the ability to control and manage the market in terms of what is available to any given reader at any given time. This has been a big part of their whole marketing strategies. Um, prior to this, publishers were the gatekeepers. They released so, only so many books a month. They knew who each other was publishing in that month. They know it from about six months out. Uh, so they could always manage what they were putting out. And because readers were only seeing what was being put out in a bookstore, the publishers essentially managed what the readers could buy. And they really resent having that taken away from them. The fact that they can't control the readers anymore. They can't manage their market anymore. They can't control what you buy. Uh, so they can see that being threatened and they saw that from the beginning. So they have resisted every step of the way uh, any sort of change. But, of course, there was far worse for them to come. In Christmas 2007, Amazon released the Kindle, the e-reader. Uh, that really moved e-reading. E-reading was actually around from about 1999. I was an e-book bestseller on Palm, the Palm Pilot way back in 1999, right? Uh, it's been around for a long time, but it wasn't really terribly accessible. So in 2007, that blew open. Um, suddenly, e-reading was accessible to everyone in a reasonable format, reasonable price. Shortly thereafter, though, they really did the final nail in the coffin. To, in early 2009, Amazon opened an online portal for authors to directly upload their e-books to uh, the store. And that was really quickly followed by Barnes & Noble with their Nook, Apple with iBooks, and Kobo, and more recently, Google Play. Right, so we have five major outlets now that authors go direct to. Right, we don't need any publisher for that. That's an enormously different situation. Uh, the other thing we've got coming in is print-on-demand publishers where, again, I can easily upload a book just online uh, to a site that will then generate uh, paperback books, right? 
those paperback books from CreateSpace, Lulu, Lightning Source, and there are others, they can go into the distributors, they go up online on Amazon, on Book Depository, on all sorts of other places, and literally they can turn up in Dimex here because Dimex can go online and order from a distributor, right? So again, I can get a book out and it can turn up even here. I'm putting it through the States, but it's coming out here. So, you know, these, these are big changes. The effect of all of these innovations is to make the world an author's oyster, right? Authors no longer need publishers to reach 100% of their ebook audience or their audiobook audience, and 10 plus percent of their print audience will be buying online. So they can reach that lot too. And then, as I said, you can actually pick up through uh, these new distributors that are coming online, you can pick up even print readers in bookstores. That's still evolving, but it's coming. Today, the only lure publishers retain for entertainment fiction authors, those authors whose books keep the lights on year in and year out, in pu is publishers' ability to get books out into the offline print market. And that means into your Target, your Walmart, your Safeway. In the States, it's very uh, widespread where your book might be turning up. Airports, etc., and also into the major bookstores like Barnes and Noble, you know, onto the front pinch, onto the front tables, onto the new release shelves. That's something that publishers only can do, and that's still there. However, that ability itself is imploding as the stores themselves take fewer and fewer titles in decreasing numbers, which in turn drives more readers online because the reader turns up, the book they want is not there. So they eventually get frustrated, go online. This is not the publishers doing this, I might add. This is the stores because they have their own like return on um, each foot of shelf space and the margin on, particularly on paperback books, doesn't do it anymore. So it's the stores driving this. A downward spiral has started in that market. The more stores reduce the selection available to readers, the more readers go online. Once online, readers see massive selection that's very decently priced and, oh, look, in, at no increased cost, I get it delivered to my door. Why would the reader ever go into a store again for a book? You know, once online, they tend to be caught. So that's a major problem for the publishers because that market is running down and they can see that. Already, as of the first quarter of 2015, more than 50% of the adult fiction units sold, and this is the last quarter, um, the first three months of this year, more than 50% of adult fiction units sold in the US by the top 30 publishers by size were ebooks. The overall percentage of print plus ebook plus audiobooks sold online as a total obviously has to be much higher than that. The tide toward online domination of fiction book markets, of the fiction book market, is only growing stronger. And you know what the Bard said about tides? In case you've forgotten, let's see if we can get this up. This is what he said There is a tide in the affairs of men which, taken at the flood, leads on to fortune. Omitted, all the voyage of their lives is bound in shallows and miseries. On such a full sea are we now afloat, and we must take the current when it serves or lose our ventures. That's pretty much true of all of life. There are times when you have to move, or you're going to end up in shallows and miseries. Well, for corporate, corporate publishers, the time to launch on the digital tide came in 2012. They had to move by then. They did not move. They did that deliberately. They missed the tide. They have failed to innovate. They've refused to grasp the true opportunities of the digital revolution. And yes, absolutely, there's a place for them in it. But they have to step up and take it. And they're continuing to refuse to this day to accept that those who produce content are now king. They still think the crown is theirs and that they control the industry and that we authors, we absolutely must want to publish through them. As an illustration of just how strange that concept is, the difference between an author selling her book, print or ebook, online ver via a publisher versus doing it herself is 
4.6 times to the author. All right, so, and already she will actually earn 4.6 times more per sale if she does it herself. Right, that's a big difference. And if she's an already established author with an established website, and there's a huge number of us in the entertainment fiction industry who've been in this business for more than 20 years, and we have established authors, uh, established readerships. We've established websites, of course we have. We have high email, um, high quality email lists, newsletter lists, and we have an established Facebook presence. And if all of that's so, then almost guaranteed 50% of that author's sales will be online. So you do the maths. She may lose 50% when she goes and does it herself, but she'll get 4.6 times the return. Now, you know, that's pretty standard maths, but you have to remember that most publishers are actually run by literary majors, right? I have seen this myself. You give them a spreadsheet, they go, oh, what's that? You know, they can't do basic maths. Literally, I mean, how can you miss this? Okay, so why would an author sign with a publisher? Well, the only reason is if they pay her heaps of money, and they occasionally do that. But publishers generally don't want to do that. Uh, it's possibly getting to the point where they're not going to be able to afford to do that, uh, even for established bestsellers. Those one rung down from the what we call mega sellers, which are the Kings, the Pattersons, the Nora Roberts, the Janet Ivanoviches, right? Um, publishers absolutely have to hold those authors. If they don't, they're gone. Uh, but they don't want to pay anybody else the heaps of money anymore. And the advances have just been like bottom, you know, dropping to nothing, to, to a smidgen of what they were before. Um, they need to pay themselves first. And they want to take, and in fact they count on taking, 52% of every online sale for themselves that's how highly they value their services. Uh, they offer authors a mere 15%. So that's the sort of difference. Yet publishers have not, even to this day, adequately tooled up for online publishing. For instance, their understanding of metadata, just even what it is, let alone how to optimise it, is, shall we say, severely lacking. I took control of my metadata for my last three books um, and I improved my pre-orders by two times, 2.4 times, 2.6 times over what HarperCollins could achieve for my immediate previous books. That was just me taking control of the metadata and getting it right, all right? My, I have metadata battles literally every single week and they're different every single week. Um, I've got a book coming out in uh, January next year, it went up for pre-order. I made sure they had the right metadata categories for it. And I started to see it churn, and it's churning under Scottish. The book is set in West Africa, people. I gave you the right things. What happened? My previous book was set in Scotland. So somehow or another, an internal database had just immediately decided that everything that I write had to have Scottish on it. <laughs> And although they input, they faithfully inputted the right categories, that database had behind the scenes, and no one knew it did this, come in and overridden. And so the new book went out with a Scottish category. And so I'm jumping up and down here and yelling, and they're, they're trying to figure out how the hell this database had come in and crunched uh, what was right and turned it into what was wrong. Those are the sorts of issues. It's their systems more than anything else that are just not geared up and they just can't seem to find the... Someone called inertia? Yes, if they have inertia. They can't move and change these things. So publishers are sinking because they have failed to adequately adapt, but they are also being impacted by five compounding issues. They're, the issues, I'm just going to go through them very quickly. They have a monstrous corporate size. They are monsters now. Their overheads are enormous. Their sunk capital is huge and they need to pay their corporate owners a, an acceptable return. So that's a massive financial burden and it's only going to get worse. Two, they have a need to make available all their backlist in ebook and print on demand in order to hold the rights. For a publisher, the rights that they carry from their previous licensing agreements, that is their 
assets, long-term assets. They can't afford to let those go, but in order to keep them, they have to get those books out. But that's a massive work overload for their or their people. Uh, they're not taking on staff. Every time they merge, they drop staff, right? So, but all the staff have to now perform some, at some astronomical level in order to get these books out. But not only that, that means that their new books have to compete with every other book that ever, was ever, ever, ever published, right? That make, makes it more and more difficult for them to maintain their bestseller numbers, particularly online. Three is the decline of print in stores, I've already mentioned that, and also the rise of print-on-demand outlets, uh, which make authors like me able to get a book into Dimmicks here. Right? That's a real problem, and it's, again, it's only going to get worse, and that runs down their offline print capability as an attraction. Four is authors' direct access to professional services such as editing, cover photography, and design formatting, and all else. I now have teams set up for my own, right? I can do all of those things and I have professional people at each of those, I have professional teams on each of those arms, if you like, each of those departments. I can, all authors can bring all of that internally now. For authors, it's actually enormously more efficient for us to organise this ourselves rather than give it over to a publisher. For already established authors, readers can't tell the difference between a really well-published, self-published work versus a publisher-produced work. And if they do, and I've actually had Kirkus, one of the most esteemed magazines, say of my most recent, um, one of my most recent books, that uh, the editing was so much better than my previous books. They didn't realise I did the editing, or I organised the editing to be done. It wasn't the publisher. Um, so that was a really sort of, mm, you know, telling comment, shall we say. Uh, publishers departments are handling 50 plus, and it'll be, for some of them, it'll be an enormous number of new releases every month, right? So how can a publisher, publishers departments, give the same detailed care to an author's work that an author publishing maybe one every five months can? It's just not possible. And, and the author actually knows the book so much better than anybody who's working in the publisher's teams knows it. So it really isn't, isn't reasonable to imagine that a publisher is going to do a better job on your book than you can, not if you spend the time to learn how to do it. The last thing that's working really badly against publishers is time, because this is a little thing that very few people know. Publishing agreements in the US can be terminated with notice after 35 years. People like me are uh, intellectual property, which is our licensing rights, lasts for a long, long time. Georgette Heyer's books are still cycling, and that's like how many years? 40 years after her, her death, right? Um, copyrights now extend for 70 years after the author's death. They are really long-term assets if you have an author who has a big um, portfolio and has a big following, right? So those books are going to keep selling. Now, the publishers have always relied on that, the long tail. Uh, but now, those t those new um, the new agreements that were uh, struck after 1978 can be terminated at 35 years. Publishers always assumed authors would be so happy with them that we would never terminate our agreements with them. Um, if we don't terminate at 35 years, they go on for forever. Uh, in the publisher's hands. We can't take them back. We only have that window at 35 years. The first round was in 2013. Those were the, that was the first year authors could terminate 1978 contracts. And publishers were sure we wouldn't do it. Authors did. They started taking back their rights. This means that publishers are slowly losing their backlist. Every year, we get, authors take back their rights. That is a really important factor that is sort of like eroding what publishers have in their back pocket, if you like. Okay, so that's going on as well. So time is not on their side in that way. Um, the problem is also, of course, that authors are taking back those rights and they're putting the books up. So the books don't disappear. The books are still up there, right? So nothing changes from the author's point of view. It changes from the publisher's point of view. The golden age for authors is definitely here. The time when, as for a very large 
number of professional, uh, create, creative professionals, uh, we're enabled by the internet. Authors can now operate on a C to C basis, a, a creator to customer basis, right? That's really the ultimate inefficient supply chain and we're getting very close to that. Not every author will choose to go down the path, at least not at first. But as publishers' revenues decline, they have less and less capacity to fund the publication of narrative fiction, which is the type most easily translated to ebooks. More and more authors are electing to take the publisher's role and others are being forced to it as they no longer are being uh, re-upped for a contract. So now we have a golden age for readers on the one hand, more books available than ever before and available to everyone at a decent price, and a golden age for authors, higher returns in the world their oyster, running concurrently. However, for corporate publishers it's really hard to see, given that their business model is based on taking from both authors and readers, how they can now have a new golden age. Other publishers, smaller publishers perhaps, the corporate publishers have written their, their future already. Um, of course there are unforeseen consequences for authors in the sea change. One is increasing business focus. We've had to learn business where we never had to learn before, um, but we're doing it. And we've never had to learn about packaging, pricing, marketing, editing, formatting, but we all are. Now control is passing into authors' hands and authors are relishing the freedom that comes with that control. Another change becoming apparent is that we value our time. We didn't before because we could only write so many books a year according to the publisher's schedule. Right? I used to do two a year. Uh, I can do four a year. Uh, that's a very big difference in how I'm going to be using my time. Now author's time equals production equals income. It, that equation never operated for us for the last, what, 60 or more years. Right? It does now. So we're all taking advantage of that and you will no longer find the hotly contested board seats on authors' organisations, um, which you know people used to fight over to get. Now they can't get nominations because everybody's too busy writing. So for, the, for books, it's a good age. There's going to be a lot of books out there uh, and some will be the next wave. So authors are, well, the biggest change in author um, the author core as a whole, is renewed enthusiasm. A re-emergence of, for what most of us is the joy of creation that originally brought us to written storytelling. We have rediscovered the joy in our work. And I want to leave you with this thought. Almost everyone here in this room is younger than I am. So from experience, let me tell you this. Keeping, nurturing and protecting the joy that you have in whatever you do is essential for a happy and productive life. Thank you.